Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather going to be like? How am I going to fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions, like why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? I had arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with. Is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. And I found purpose, I found meaning, I found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather going to be like? How am I going to fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions, like why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? I had arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with. Is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. And I found purpose, I found meaning, and I 
that found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. Glenn, you made it. It's 2021. Happy New Year. And you made it to service on time. Here at River Glen, we've been looking forward to 2021 with a fresh, bold start and all sort of fresh beginnings. Last year was so crazy that many of us were focused on just plowing through. Maybe you let some things slip, like your exercise routine, healthy eating habits, or maybe your valued relationships. Or maybe you keep thinking about how, even through all these things, we can make this year better. 2021 is here, and now is the time to get going. In our Atomic Habits message series, we'll discover the little bitty changes that you can make to have a huge impact in your life. And if you're newer here checking things out today, that's great. We're so glad you're here. We've got hosts online in the chat windows, so be sure to give them a shout out and let them know you're here. We're gonna be celebrating communion every weekend. Just grab something to eat and drink so you're ready later in the service. And if you have kids at home, please check out our online Kid Life resources after service. It's something you can do with your kids so that they can grow a strong faith in Jesus. This could be a great routine to start with them this year. Service is almost ready to start. So are you ready for transformation? Let's do this. Well, good morning, everybody. I want to invite you to stay with us. We're going to sing together this morning.
Well, I can probably say it's been a chaotic week for a lot of us, but we know that in the midst of the unknown, we have a God who promises to bring peace and restoration to this world and to our lives. He is the God that has won victory over sin and darkness on behalf. And we can be united knowing this and taking rest in this. We have a new song that we want to sing together with you this morning. It's called Awake My Soul. And some of the lyrics to this song take my breath away. It reminds us to awake from our slumber and remember who it is we are worshiping. So let's sing this together.
And let's sing together now. We're going to sing, People Come Together. People come together, strange as neighbors, our blood is one. Children of generations of every nation, the kingdom come. So don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high, don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from.
salvation is in his blood. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. Thanks so much for singing with us this morning. You guys can be seated. We're going to continue to worship this morning by taking communion together. And we remember that Jesus was the very first to begin this act of communion. Before he died, he was sitting down with his disciples for one last supper. And he took the loaf of bread on the table and he handed it to them and he said, I want you to eat this and I want you to remember that this is my body that will be sacrificed for you. And then later he took the cup and he said, drink this. This is a symbol of my blood that will be shed for you on the cross. And they took the bread and they, they ate and they took the juice and they drank together. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. And even still today, we are practicing this act of pausing to take the bread and the juice to remember Jesus' sacrifice for us. I remember that he didn't just die, but three days later, he rose again from the grave and he is alive. He has conquered death and he has conquered sin and darkness in our place. And we can take this together no matter where we are. If you are online with us, grab some bread and juice. And if you're here in the room, there's bread and juice over there by entrances if you haven't grabbed it already. The bread is on the top and the juice is on the bottom. And we'll do this together, remembering Jesus says sacrifice was done for us. Let me say a prayer. Father God, we thank you. And we acknowledge that you are the purpose you are the point and you are our hope. You are why we are here. And Father, we pray that your spirit will speak to us, will move us, will change us. Father, we pray that these next few moments will be a pause in the middle of our lives to remember that you are a part of this story and you are at the core of it. We love you and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Each week we take time in our service to, to give back to God. And we often talk about the three ways to give. But if we really want to build a habit of generosity, I think it's important to know maybe three reasons why we give. And the first one is because God asks us to. He asks us to take our tithes and our offerings to the local church so it can make a difference in the lives of others spiritually, but also meet the physical needs of the community as well. We give because Christ gave. He gave sacrificially. He gave his life for us and the least that we can do is to give back to him but we're called Christians which means we're Christ followers we do what Christ does and Christ lived a, a life of generosity the third and I think probably the most important though is we give because we love him we realize that everything that we have even the breath that we take is a gift and a blessing from God and so we want to show God that we put him first in our life and that's in every area 
So there are three ways that you can do that. You can give by dropping off your offering in the, the boxes as you head out today. If you're online, you can click the link that the host provides. Or you can give by following the texting information on the screen behind me. But however you choose to give, I just ask that you give with an open heart and a loving heart back to God. Well, as you guys can see, I'm wearing an Alpha shirt. That means it's Alpha time. It's an Alpha session for the winter that's coming up. If you've never heard about Alpha, let me tell you a little bit about it. It's a 10-week course. I know that sounds scary because we're saying course, but trust me, there's no homework. You do get one of these cool little books that help you go through a video that you watch. Uh, you share a meal. You get a free dinner. That's a win right off the bat. They have child care as well, but you'll watch the video, and then you'll just discuss kind of your thoughts on it. Now, if you're a Christian, this is going to help really solidify your foundation. But if you're not a Christian and you're new to this whole faith thing, this is going to be a great opportunity to come together and maybe ask some questions and potentially start your faith journey. Now, here's the thing. If you show up for two weeks, sign up, go for two weeks. If you don't like it, you can always leave. At least you got two dinners out of it, right? But if you want to stay on and you enjoyed those two weeks and you make it through the full 10 weeks, I guarantee you by the time you're done, you're going to look back at this point and you're going to realize this was a, a point in your life where everything kind of switched and you began an unbelievable faith journey. So if you are interested in signing up with Alpha or even finding out more information about it, you can go to the connect wall or you can fill out the welcome card in the seat back in front of you and just say, I'm interested in Alpha and drop it off uh, in the boxes as you leave today. Well, I have some news that I wanted to share with you. Uh, recently, uh, Isaac and Kaylee Morris, uh, Isaac is our, our junior high pastor, uh, they let us know that they are having their first child. That's exciting, right? We're really excited for the two of them. But there's some sad news that comes with that too. Uh, they've decided to move back to Knoxville, Tennessee to, to raise their child next to their family. Isaac's been here for two years. Uh, we've loved having him here. He's done an unbelievable job with the students. Uh, they just got back from winter camp, and I heard they had a great time there as well. Isaac's going to be over at the Student Center right after service. If you want to stop by and thank him for all the work that he's done. Uh, Kaylee's already left. She's got a job opportunity, but Isaac will be here for the rest of the week. You can email him or stop by the office and say thank you as well. well. We have a great message for you today as we continue in Atomic Habits. We have a guest speaker, Jared Walker. Jared is the former pastor of Legacy Christian Church in Wauwatosa. It was one of our church plants, our early church plants. He also is with CFR now, which helped us with this building and with the loan that we have. Uh, but more importantly, he's a good friend of ours. He attends our Pewaukee campus, and anytime we have an opportunity to have him come up and speak, we jump at it because he's such a great speaker. Well, when he comes up, let's give him a nice River Glen welcome. Check out the video. Thanks for the welcome. Always great to, to teach here again at River Glen. And here we are, uh, 10 days into January, into the new year. How you doing on your New Year's resolutions? Need a little bit of a, a motivation boost? You know, this is the time of the year that we're often thinking about those new habits we want to form, some new commitments that we want to make. And yet, statistically, I just heard this last week, that by Valentine's Day, just six weeks into the year, 92% of New Year's resolutions have already been abandoned, all right? So if you need a little bit of motivation, who better than to motivate us than a retired naval four-star admiral? Admiral William McRaven gave a commencement speech a few years ago for the graduation ceremony at the University of Texas in Austin. 
and he based his speech on his experiences 36 years before during basic SEAL training. He built the theme of his speech around the motto of the school, which is this, what starts here changes the world. He gave the graduates 10 things to do if they wanted to change the world. He's humorous, and at first you hear the audience laughing, and then they start to understand the significance of these truths that he's stating. And by the end of his speech, everybody's silent, and the speech actually went viral. Well, here is the first key thing he told students if they wanted to change the world. Listen to this. Every morning in SEAL training, my instructors, who at the time were all Vietnam veterans, would show up in my barracks room, and the first thing they'd do was inspect my bed. If you did it right, the corners would be square, the covers would be pulled tight, the pillow centered just under the headboard, and the extra blanket folded neatly at the foot of the rack. It was a simple task, mundane at best, but every morning we were required to make our bed to perfection. It seemed a little ridiculous at the time, particularly in light of the fact that we were aspiring to be real warriors, tough, battle-hardened SEALs. But the wisdom of this simple act has been proven to me many times over. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made, <laughs> that you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. So if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. So if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. If you want to make a big difference, start with something small. We started a series here last week all about that. Ben mentioned a, a book that actually serves as the inspiration for the, the title of this series called Atomic Habits. And actually, interestingly enough, a few months ago, my team at Christian Financial Resources, we started reading this book together just as part of our professional development. And if you missed last week, I can't encourage you strongly enough to, to go online and watch it because all the, the messages in these, this series, they connect, they build on one another. And last week, Ben talked about three levels of change, kind of concentric circles. And he started on the outer circle, which is the do part of habits and, and goals. This is the resolutions. You know, hey, I want to lose weight. I want to eat better. I want to go to the gym. Then we move in a circle, and that's the, the how circle. This is the habits, the system that we put into place to try and do those things, to make those things happen. We're going to talk about the how today and next week. But last week we learned that that innermost circle is where we need to start when it comes to transformation and behavior and habits. It starts with who, my identity, because who I am and who I want to become, that drives my behavior. To initiate change that will lead to true life transformation, you have to start with who. And we got some homework last week to go ahead and write out some who goals. Who is it that we want to become? And today we're going to talk about the how part. The habits, the systems we put into place so that based on who we want to become, we can do the things that we want to be doing. Last week we learned this about habits. 40 to 50% of life is not the result of conscious decisions, but of daily habits. So what we're experiencing in life today, it is built almost half by simply the habits that we've either just fallen into or that we have chosen to adopt. Now, some of you are going to hear this, and you're going to use this this week. Here's what's going to happen. Somebody, somebody here in, in Waukesha or somebody in Pewaukee, somebody joining us online, here's what's going to happen. You're going to do something stupid this week. And your spouse, your significant other is going to say, why in the world did you do that? That was so dumb. And you're going to say, 
weren't you listening in church? I didn't choose to do that. It's just a habit, right? And you're probably going to hear back, then you need some new habits. And that is what we're going to try to do today is give you some tools to start some new habits. Last week, we saw how focusing on habits, thinking about habits, that's actually a biblical concept. We looked at the example of Paul. We looked at the example of Jesus. And we also briefly looked at the example of a guy named Daniel. And today I want to look at Daniel a little bit deeper and a little more detail to see what we learn from his experience about habits. Now, if you have heard about the story of Daniel before, what probably comes to mind with Daniel is Daniel in the lion's den. I mean, that's what he's known for, right? That he faced down a den of lions uh, with confidence that God would protect him. And that's exactly what happened. And that's pretty impressive. But what is equally impressive is what led up to that experience. What in, in Daniel's life took place that put him in that scenario where he was facing the lion's den. So a little bit of context for Daniel's story. Daniel is put into a program basically for future leaders a program for young adults where they're trained to potentially become leaders. He does so well in that program that he and 119 others are appointed to government positions. So 120 people in that program given government positions. Daniel's one of those. Among those 120, three are chosen to oversee the other 117. Daniel is one of those three. Not only that, as one of those three, he gets the attention of the king, and the king has even higher aspirations for this leader, Daniel. And here's what we read in verse 3 of Daniel chapter 6. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Not just the top three, but Number one, under the king. Now, there were a lot of people unhappy about this. When somebody succeeds, there are others who don't, who become jealous and sometimes want to derail the one who's doing well. And that's what happens with Daniel. So his enemies decide to look for a way to try and bring Daniel down. Look for a flaw in his character, some kind of corruption or something. They're not able to find it. Here's what we read in verses 4 and 5 of Daniel chapter 6. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So Daniel's integrity was so intact that they couldn't find any way to bring him down. They finally decided the only way that they could do it is if they somehow made it look like Daniel was having to choose between his God and the king because they knew the seriousness of his faithfulness to God. And so here's what they did. We read in the next few verses that they tricked the king into issuing issuing a decree that for the next 30 days... If anyone prays to anyone other than the king, that person will be thrown into a den of lions. And that's what leads Daniel to the whole den of lions experience. Now, what was it in Daniel's life, number one, that caused him to be identified by the king as such a great potential leader? And number two, caused him to be without flaw in his character so that his enemies had no accusation to be able to bring against him. Well, we find out from verse 10 what it is in his character. It's really a system of habits that he has in place. Here's what we read in verse 10. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God. And was this something new? No, it was a habit, a system he already had in place. Because we read here, just as he had done before. Not once a day, not twice a day, three times a day, Daniel connected with God in prayer. Not if he happened to remember, not when it was convenient, not when he'd already watched all the newest releases on Disney+. Plus. He made it a regular part of his day to commune with God, to bring his concerns to God, to thank God for his goodness and his faithfulness in his life, to listen to God and how he wanted to direct his path. 
He prioritized this in his life and made sure the schedule of his life, the routine of his life accommodated this intimate time with his heavenly father. He lived a system of habits. And one small discipline had a huge impact over time. I want to make sure that we don't miss this. Never underestimate how our God can start something big through one small habit. One small act of faithfulness God loves to bless and do amazing things through. And if one small habit can have such an impact in the life of Daniel, I can believe it it can have equally as significant of an impact in my life, equally as significant an impact in your life. So in the next few moments, I want us to take a look at what experts tell us are key if we are going to, to start a new habit and make it stick. So if you're taking notes, here's number one. If you want a new habit to stick, you have to make it obvious. Make it obvious. Give you an example from scientific research. In 2001, a British study was done. 248 people who wanted to start a new habit of working out. They divided those people into three groups. Every group, they said, for the next few weeks, we want you to track how many times each week you work out. The first group was the control group. That's the only instruction they gave them. Track for the next few weeks how often you work out. The second group told the same thing, track it, but they also provided them with a bunch of motivational resources, books on the benefits of working out, magazine articles about the risks of a sedentary life, things like heart disease and blood pressure, things like that, and how working out would would be beneficial. So they provided lots of motivation to the second group. The third group, again, track for the next few weeks how many times you work out, but they asked them one thing different from the other groups. They said, right now we want you to go ahead and tell us where and when you plan to work out. So of those three groups, which group do you think was most successful? Interestingly enough, the first two groups, there was virtually no difference between the two. 35% versus 38% at, at the end of several weeks actually had formed a new habit. Motivation was virtually insignificant, almost no difference. But the group that said right up front when they were going to work out and where, 91% of them had formed a habit of working out by the end of that study. They were simply asked to fill in three blanks in one statement. The statement was this, I will exercise weekly on blank for the day, at blank for the time, in blank for the place. And that led to a 91% success rate compared to 35 and 38% for the other two groups. Experts tell us that the two most common cues or triggers to help us stay consistent with a habit are time and location. So let's say you want to read your Bible more. Great thing that all of us should say, hey, we want to to make this a, a key habit, reading our Bible. It's not enough to say, I'm going to do it. It's not enough to say I'm going to do it every day. You need to assign a time and location to say, you know what? The alarm goes off at 6.30 a.m. So at 6.31 a.m., I'm going to sit in this chair with my Bible. So the time and location I have declared and I have identified, and that is going to help me establish the new habit. You have to pick a specific time and a specific place. We think motivation is big. We think if we just had a little more motivation, we could stick with this habit. I must must not be motivated enough. I need to watch one more TED Talk or one more YouTube video to keep me on track and motivated. James Clear, author of the Atomic Habits book, he says this. Many people think they lack motivation when what they really lack is clarity. Make it obvious. And as humans, we are very visually oriented. What we see matters. Last week, we heard about the suggestion of those who, who want to start a habit of running, and so they'll lay out their clothes the night before, their running clothes, so they're there when they wake up first thing, so they're obvious. I have friends who actually sleep in their running clothes. So as soon as they wake up, pull out sheets, oh yeah, I guess I'm running this morning, right? They made it really obvious. We need to think about what we see. Really fascinating study. You're going to think I'm making this up, but I'm not. You can read about it in the Atomic Habits book. Fascinating study done at the airport in Amsterdam in 1990. The cleaning staff there was frustrated with the continual state of of mess in the men's restrooms. Now, having traveled uh, at airports, I do not know what it is about men at airports, but they cannot hit a urinal to save their life, apparently. It's disgusting, all right? Sorry. And some of you are going, 
It's not just at airports. The guys at my house have the same problem, right? So here's what they decided to do. I'm not joking. You read about it in the book. They found stickers of flies. And they put those stickers in the urinals for guys to aim at. And guess what? In one year, their cleaning costs were cut by 8%. Simply by making it obvious where they needed to go. Uh, Clearly it wasn't enough already. By giving something visually obvious, it made a difference. So you want to eat better. Stand in your kitchen. Think about what you see. Those cookies probably shouldn't be out on the counter. Replace them with fruit. When you open the fridge door, what do you see? You want to read your Bible? Bible on your pillow when you make your bed, right, every day. Put your Bible on the pillow so you don't go to sleep without seeing it and being reminded to read about it. Make it obvious. I heard Ashley Wooldrich, pastor in Arizona, give a talk about habits. He said this, small changes in what you see can lead to big changes in what you do. You have trouble remembering to take a a particular medication? Put it where you see it every morning, maybe on the bathroom sink. Don't miss how visual cues matter in a big way. You want to read the Bible app more on your phone? Make sure that the shortcut to the app is right there on the first screen you see when you unlock your phone. In fact, you could make it the only app on the initial screen. Move everything else to another screen so you have to go past the Bible app to get there so that you see it every time you unlock your phone. Give yourself that visual cue, that visual trigger. When it comes to forming a new habit, we need to think about a specific time, a specific location, and make it really visual. That's how we make it obvious. So that's the first way that we make a habit stick. The second thing we have to do if we want it to stick, we have to make it easy. And this can be really counterintuitive. If you're like a type A driven personality like me, I mean, you you tend to approach things as like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go big or go home. If it's something that I want to honor God, why should I give him anything other than the biggest and most significant thing I can? So I'm going to make this go big. But what experts tell us is that will actually derail you making it too big. Here's what Jesus said, words recorded in Matthew 11. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. See, at that time, there were a lot of religious teachers. They were known as rabbis. And they would have followers or disciples. And their followers would be told by the rabbi all these things they needed to do if they wanted to be their followers. And they kind of got a reputation of of putting heavy burdens on those who wanted to learn from them and follow them. It was really burdensome to become associated with a rabbi. And Jesus said, you know what? Following me, it's not meant to be burdensome. Now, that doesn't mean it will always be easy. In fact, it's why we're talking right now about some habits that will help keep us on the path of following him. But when we bring those things into our life that keep us in line with what what he wants for us, our life isn't meant to become more burdensome. It's meant to be more fulfilling and meaningful because it's in line with what God intended for us. So I want you to think differently when you start a new habit. Here's what I would tell you. Don't start with big In fact, a small habit is better. I mean, this series is called Atomic Habits. And last week we learned what the word atomic means. Extremely minute, microscopic, itty bitty, tiny. So my suggestion to you when it comes to starting a habit that will stick, that will impact your life, start with a small change. Somebody needs to hear this and be reminded of this. Don't ever underestimate how one small change done repeatedly can absolutely transform your life. Think about some of your bad habits. Were they hard to fall into? No. And that's why you repeat them so often, why they're so so repeatable, because they're easy. So when it comes to good habits, we need to start with making them easy so that we can fall into those as well and make them very repeatable. Hitting the snooze button on your alarm, you didn't have to train yourself that habit. Binge watching Netflix, you didn't have to train yourself. Those are easy habits. Pick easy habits so that we'll start and stick with it and it will become something that over time transforms our lives. Now I want you to notice what I'm not saying. I'm not saying only do easy things. I'm just saying when you start, make it easy. You wanna start reading your Bible more? You don't have to start with two hours a day. Start with five minutes a day. You wanna start inviting people to church? You don't have to invite 100 people. Start with inviting one. 
You want to start investing in your kids more spiritually? Start by praying with them two sentences before bed every night. You want to become a more grateful person? Write one thank you note a week to someone who's impacted your life. You want to be more organized? Remember the Navy, Navy Admiral? Make your bed every day. Start with that. You want to be a person that's healthier? Make a commitment to walk 10 minutes a week. See, here's the thing about life change. Life change doesn't happen when we do something big occasionally. It happens when we do something small consistently. We do something small, something that's repeatable, that we're consistent with, and over time it transforms us. That's what happened with Daniel. And consistency is key because it reinforces my identity. It becomes a part of who I am when I'm able to be consistent. Remember, identity, who I am, who I want to be, that drives behavior. All right, so as I start a new habit, first, I need to make it obvious if it's going to stick. Second, I need to make it easy. And third, if I want it to stick, I need to make it involve community. And I'm not sure I can overstate this enough. Whom you surround yourself with is really important to creating good habits in your life. I mean, imagine if you decide you're going to start working out, sign up for a gym. You go the first time, you got your workout clothes, you walk in, lots of exercise equipment, nobody's using it. Everybody's sitting in chairs and sofas around the room, drinking coffee and eating donuts. So you walk over to the treadmill, you start it, get warmed up, you increase the speed a little bit, whew, start to sweat a little bit. But every time you look around, all you see is people eating donuts. Are you going to be motivated to stick with it? Probably not. Next week, it's just going to be sweatpants and you're going to throw back the donuts with everybody else, right? Who you are surrounded by will greatly impact behavior. Research tells us that. Some of you, I know you, you want to change, but the people around you kind of hold you back in that. Some of you, I know you want to become Brewers fans, but all your family, they're Cubs fans. All right, get a new family, right? It's not that hard. All right, uh, understand the point here that I'm trying to make. Community is going to drive accountability in your life. And that's going to be huge in getting a habit to stick. Almost every scientific study done reinforces this. But the Bible tells us this as well. The book of Proverbs, chapter 13, verse 20, we read this. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. And if we paraphrase that to apply specifically to habits, we could say it this way. Walk with those that have the habits you want and you'll start to have those habits. Start a new habit around people that don't have that habit and you're going to always get yourself in trouble. All right, so you want to make a habit stick. You make it obvious, you make it easy, you make it involve community. Now, a while back, Ben asked me to speak in this series about habits because he knew that I had recently added some new habits in my life, specifically relating to my health. Now, I've spoken at River Glen a few times over the last few years, but we found in the video archives a time that I spoke here two years ago, December of 2018. And a few weeks after this photo was taken, I decided to add some new habits in my life. So 2019, 2020, I made a bunch of changes. And those habits resulted in big transformation. I lost 75 pounds. I got off all the blood pressure medication. Yeah, thanks. Got off the blood pressure medication. I don't use the stupid CPAP anymore. I hated that thing. But I can say from my own experience that small, consistent habits over time can lead to transformation. And as we've talked about habits this morning, maybe something has come to mind. Some, something you would like to experience. So here's what I'd like you to do. Every one of us in this room in Waukesha, everyone in the, the room at Pewaukee, everybody watching online, here's what I would like you to do right now. I would like you to pick one change that you would like to experience in your life, one transformation, what is it that you would like to, to start or experience in the days ahead? Maybe it's something related to your health. Maybe you want to start working out. Maybe you want to eat better. Maybe you want to shed a few pounds. Maybe it's something related to your finances. Maybe you want to reduce the amount of debt that you're in. Maybe you want to start saving more. Maybe you want to be able to be more generous with the people around you and toward your church. Maybe it's something related to relationships. You want to be a better husband. You want to be a better mom. You want to be a better child. You want to be a better friend. Maybe there's a conflict that you want to try and resolve in the future. 
Maybe it's something related to your faith journey. Maybe you want to read your Bible more. You want prayer to be a more significant part of your life. You want to become more confident talking with others about your faith. Pick just one thing to focus on for the next couple of minutes. Have you picked it? Now I want us all to answer three questions about making that stick. Here's the first question. How can I make it obvious? For me, something that I found helped me make it obvious as I began my health journey, I found a book that put foods into categories. And there were, there were tables in the back with these categories. There was a green column, there was a yellow column, and there was a red column. For me, reading product labels... Trying to calculate calories, that was not easy. But what was easy was to look in the chart and see if it was in the green column, okay, eat it. If it was in the yellow column, mm, make sure it's only in moderation. And if it was in the red column, run away. Put it in the trash. Don't do it. That made it obvious for me. What's the chart say? Okay, it's obvious. You want to reduce debt? Here's an idea. Take a bunch of Post-it notes. Decide each Post-it note represents $100 in debt paid off. Put a bunch of post-it notes on your mirror where you get ready in the morning. And every time you pay down $100, pull one of those post-it notes off. Make it obvious. You want to pray more. Get a notebook to write your prayers in. Put it on your nightstand so that you don't go to sleep without taking time to write at least a couple, sentence, a couple sentences of a prayer in it every day. Ask yourself, how can I make it obvious? Next question. How can I make it easy? In my health journey... I never had a goal of saying, I'm going to lose 75 pounds. That was just huge and not at all motivating. It seemed like too much to try and accomplish, but I did have a bunch of small goals along the way. And anyone who's going to tell you that you need to get healthier, they would tell you you got to do two things. Two things you have to do. You have to eat better and you have to work out. And, and I would agree, in, in 2020, I logged 1,000 miles running, okay? But starting off, I knew it had to be easy. So the first four months, I didn't work out one time, not one day. Why? Because I needed, to eat, I needed it easy to get started, and so I just focused on nutrition. And then once I had that, I had some good habits in place, then I started adding the working out component. But again, to get started, make it easy so that you'll repeat it. You want to start saving? Start with $10 a week. You want to read your Bible? Start with just five minutes a day. I'll give you a little side tip about habits. It's talked about in the book. It's called habit stacking. It can be hard to start a new habit. You know what's easier? A way to trick yourself into a new habit? Make it part of a habit you already have because you're already doing that. You want to start flossing your teeth. Don't view it as a new habit. View it as part of brushing your teeth, which you already do every day, Right? You want to pray every day? Decide that as part of the habit of making coffee, every time I hit the power button, I'm going to say a two-sentence prayer, surrendering the day to God and asking him to bless it. Habit stacking. Make it a part of a habit that you already have. Third question to ask, how can I make it involve community? Now, because of my travel, I had to be kind of creative with this one. To create accountability, I had a group of people that I would text all the time about how I was doing. And if people didn't hear from me for a few days, they'd reach out and say, hey, I haven't heard from you for a while. How are you doing? I'd send them photos of me out on a run. I'd send them photos of my meals. I've got one guy that says he's convinced I only eat salmon and asparagus because it seemed like that was every photo that I sent him of what I was eating. So that was how I created accountability in a community to help with my habits. You want to take some next steps spiritually this year? A group like Alpha Group that was just talked about? Get plugged into that as a way to get into community that will help you with next steps spiritually. How can you form a habit that involves community to get you where you want to be this year? Well, now that we've answered those three questions, I hope you've landed on a positive habit and what it's going to look like for you to make it stick. And don't get caught up into that trap of thinking, but that seems too easy or it's too small to make a difference. Because remember, even just one small change done repeatedly over time can absolutely transform your life. Let's pray together. Father, that is our prayer this morning, that we would establish one habit that by your spirit we would be empowered to repeat over time so that you would 
bless it and grow it into life transformation. And Father, we've thought about hopefully something specific this morning. We want to surrender that goal, that habit to you. Father, help us to make it easy and obvious. And Father, provide us with the community that will bring accountability to help us make it happen. Father, ultimately our goal is that we bring our lives more in tune with what you have for us. So that we don't miss out on the plan that you have laid before us for our lives. Father, we surrender our lives to you and even our habits. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together for our last song. stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working
want to thank you so much for joining us here at River Glen. If you're new with us, make sure you head on out to the Welcome Center or say hi to your hosts online, and we will see you next time. Thanks for spending time together with us. I hope that you're encouraged and able to apply today's teaching into your life immediately and that you can't wait to join us for service next weekend, either online or in person at our Waukesha or Pewaukee campuses. If you haven't already done so, click the connect button and fill out a welcome card. Be sure to let us know how we can be praying for you and how we can help you take your next steps in faith. Finally, when you fill out the welcome card, every Thursday you'll receive my What's Happening RG e-newsletter filled with encouragement and updates about River Glen for you and your family. I invite you to be on mission with River Glen, to celebrate each week at service, to contribute to our community and world, and to connect with others in faith. This is just one way that together we can make more and better followers of Jesus. Stay safe and stay on mission. See you soon.